exciting chemistry video. I am Jay Lamp Bio, and I am excited to bring to you today the concept of intermolecular forces. Now, we have previously discussed intramolecular forces, that is, the forces that exist within individual molecules or compounds. Well, today we are going to focus on the forces that exist between different molecules and how different molecules interact with each other. And then what we're going to do is correlate the strength of those intermolecular forces to other chemical properties, such as things like vapor pressure, boiling point, melting point, those types of things. Because the stronger the forces are between the individual molecules, the harder it is to break them apart. And the harder it is to break them apart, the more energy that has to be put in in order to break those intermolecular forces. So therefore, the higher the boiling point, the higher the melting point, and lower the vapor pressure. So without further ado, let's dive on in. So hopefully by the end of this video, you should be able to explain the concept of London dispersion forces, use the term polarizable electron cloud and relate the size of the molecule with the strength of the London, dis London dispersion forces, explain dipole-dipole forces as well as dipole-induced dipole forces, why they occur and their relative strength, as well as ion-dipole forces. In addition, we'll also talk about things like hydrogen bonding, which isn't included on this list. Oh wait, yeah, it is, it's right there at the bottom. I just can't read. We're going to determine the strength of the ion-dipole forces based on the magnitude of charge and atomic radius and explain hydrogen bonding and why it occurs. So we're looking at a variety of different types of bonds in between different molecules. Let's get going. So first off, let's talk about intermolecular forces. And these are just simply forces that exist between different particles. Now, again, previously we have talked about intramolecular forces, which are forces that exist within individual molecules or compounds. Now, Different types of molecules are going to have different types of intermolecular forces. So it's very important for you to be able to discern which types of molecules have which types of intermolecular forces. As you notice here on the right hand side, different intermolecular forces also have different relative strengths. You notice that the ion dipole forces with uh, you know, 40 to 600 is much stronger than that of say London dispersion forces, which are 0.05 to 40. So there's lots of information that we can gather based on determining what types of intermolecular forces are present, their relative strengths, and how that correlates to a variety of different chemical properties. And as we discussed previously, the stronger the intermolecular forces, they're directly tied to higher boiling points and melting points. We do need to keep in mind that intermolecular forces are weaker than intramolecular forces, meaning that ionic and covalent bonds are always going to be stronger than the forces that exist between different molecules. So the bonds that exist within molecules are stronger than those that exist between different ones. This impacts the length and the strength of the bonds when we compare them. So let's dive in and compare the different types of intermolecular forces and how we can determine different properties based on that information. So let's first talk about London dispersion forces, and these are a result of temporary fluctuating dipoles due to the uneven random distribution of electrons in an atom. You know that electrons don't cleanly orbit around the nucleus in nice little orbits. They exist in three-dimensional regions known as orbitals. Now these electrons move randomly. So as a result, those electrons could at one particular point be on one side of the atom, while we have few or no electrons on the opposite side. Well, what that does is that creates a temporary dipole. A dipole just refers to one side of an atom or molecule having a greater negative charge while the opposite side has a greater positive charge. In this case, it has to do with the uneven distribution of electrons. If all the electrons are on one side of an atom or molecule, that side is going to have a relative negative charge. As you can see here on the right hand side, we have a delta, lowercase delta negative for the side that has all of the electrons on it. The opposite side, because it has fewer or no electrons, is going to be relatively positive. Well, as we know, a relative positive charge is going to be attracted to the negative charge on another atom or molecule. So that results in an attraction between two different molecules. Now the strength of the forces increases as the size of the molecule or the number of electrons increases. So smaller atoms or molecules will have fewer London dispersion forces than larger molecules because they have fewer electrons and thus creating a smaller temporary dipole. Whereas larger molecules can create larger temporary dipoles or multiple temporary dipoles, thus increasing the London dispersion forces that are present. The rationale for that is what's known as a polarizable electron cloud. Larger molecules have larger polarizable electron clouds, i.e. 
more electrons in their electron clouds and therefore can have a larger or more London dispersion forces. So the intermolecular forces are going to be stronger in larger molecules, at least in terms of London dispersion forces, than smaller ones. The asymmetric random distribution of electrons results in one side having a relative positive charge while the other side is relatively negative. And as we talked about, columbic attractions occur between positive end of one and the negative of another. So if we have two molecules, that look like what we have on the right-hand side. There's going to be a temporary attraction between the positive end of one molecule and the negative end of a second molecule. Now, again, these are only temporary. Because all molecules have electrons in their outer shells, all molecules have London dispersion forces. It just depends on the size of the molecule in regards to how many or how strong the London dispersion forces are. And so therefore, larger molecules typically have higher boiling points, higher melting points, due to the fact that they have London dispersion forces. So again, all molecules have London dispersion forces, both molecules that are polar and molecules that are non-polar. So let's take a look at a practice problem here. Let's explain why at 298K, iodine is a solid where bromine is a liquid. Well, if we take a look at where iodine and bromine are located on the periodic table, you'll find that they're both halogens. In addition to that, they are both diatoms. That is, iodine is I2 and bromine is Br2. Now, both of these molecules are symmetrical, so therefore these molecules are nonpolar. So these are only so these molecules are only going to have London dispersion forces. So, so we take a step back and think about these different states of matter. Solid at the same temperature at which bromine is a liquid, the solid is going to have stronger intermolecular forces. They're going to be held closer together than bromine. Well, that makes sense because iodine has a larger polarizable electron cloud. Iodine is a larger atom or molecule, if you think about it in terms of I2, than bromine is because it's further down the periodic table. The atomic radius is larger, so therefore it is a larger molecule than bromine. So therefore, iodine has more London dispersion forces than bromine does, and as a result, those stronger intermolecular forces result in iodine being a solid at 298K, where bromine is only going to be a liquid because it has weaker London dispersion forces. So again, iodine and bromine are both nonpolar compounds, so the only intermolecular forces they possess are London dispersion forces. Iodine is a solid when compared to bromine due to the larger amount of London dispersion forces due to the larger polarizable electron cloud of iodine as it has more electrons than bromine. Thus, stronger intermolecular forces directly correlates to a higher melting point, which is why iodine is a solid and bromine is a liquid at this temperature. So it's not just important to be able to understand which atoms have which type of intermolecular forces, but how they interact with each other and how that results in different chemical properties, such as iodine being a solid and bromine being a liquid at room temperature. All right, let's move on to the next intermolecular force. So while London dispersion forces are temporary dipoles, dipole-dipole forces are stronger interactions because they result from permanent dipoles that exist on polar molecules. The strength of the intermolecular force is correlated to the strength of the dipole. So if I take a look here, we have HCl. Um, if you were to draw the Lewis dot structure for HCl, you would find that chlorine is going to have most of the electrons surrounding it. Furthermore, it is also more electronegative. So the bond between hydrogen and chlorine uh, most of those electrons are going to be pulled towards that chlorine atom on the HCl molecule. So chlorine also has all these lone pair of electrons surrounding it. So we can say that chlorine has a relative negative charge when compared to hydrogen, which has a relative positive charge of the molecule. The negative charge on one molecule is going to be attracted to the positive charge on another due to Coulomb's law. Now, the difference here is that with London dispersion forces, they were temporary. Those electrons fluctuated moving around the atom or molecule. Here, they are permanent dipoles uh, due to the fact of the, they're permanent dipoles due to the fact of the molecule being polar, i.e. having a large difference in electronegativity. So the chlorine's always going to be relatively negative and the hydrogen is always going to be relatively positive and we're gonna have that attraction there. Now, typically, if we're looking at them on a one-to-one -one scale, a dipole-dipole force is going to be a stronger intermolecular force than a London dispersion force. So just going to keep that in mind. Now, ion-dipole forces are even stronger interactions because of the presence of an ion in a polar substance. Attraction types and strengths directly correlate to Coulomb's law. So if we take a look here, let's say we take sodium chloride and we dissolve it into water. Well, when we dissolve sodium chloride into water, it dissociates into its ions, sodium forming a positive ion and chlorine forming a negative ion. Well, the positively charged sodium ion 
is going to have an attraction to the negatively charged oxygen on a water molecule. We know that water is polar, and then oxygen is the more electronegative part of the water molecule, so therefore it will have a relative negative charge, as seen in the diagram here on the right. The relatively negatively charged oxygen is going to be attracted to the very positively charged sodium ion, thus creating ion dipole forces between those two separate molecules. We can also see this in the chlorine ion, as the chlorine ion is going to take a strong negative charge, and therefore is going to be attracted to the relatively charged, the relatively charged positive hydrogens on water molecules themselves. So we can see the attraction there as well. Again, these, if we're looking at them from a one-to-one -one scale, these are typically the stronger intermolecular forces that exist, but the strength of attraction is directly correlated to Coulomb's law. So we need to think about things like atomic radius. And we also need to think about things like the magnitude of the charge. Things like plus two and plus three are going to have a stronger ion dipole force attraction with water than things that might be plus two or plus one. Now, hydrogen bonding is a specific type of dipole-dipole intermolecular force. So we're still looking at molecules that are polar, but it has to have a hydrogen that is covalently bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. The reason that these are stronger is because of the larger difference in electronegativity. Oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine are the three highest electronegative elements that are on the periodic table. So as a result, the larger difference in electronegativity results in a stronger dipole-dipole force. So strong, we actually give it a new name, hydrogen bonding. So if we take a look at the example here on the right, we can see that water hydrogen bonds, uh, the hydrogen that is located on the water molecule is attracted to the negatively charged oxygen on similar water molecules. That's what results in water having some very unique and, and special properties, like cohesion and adhesion. You remember a little meniscus that exists in a, uh, in a graduated cylinder. You can also imagine if you've ever done the lab where you take a penny and you put droplets of water on the penny and you can see the dome over the top, or if you've ever filled up a glass of water and you can see it kind of goes over the top. Those are some unique properties that are exclusive to water due to the fact of the large amounts of hydrogen bonding that takes place. So when we compare these, we can see the relative strengths of the ion forces are shown in the diagram here on the right. London dispersion forces, as we take them from a one-to-one -one basis, are typically weaker than uh, dipole dipole hydrogen bonding and ion dipole now just because one molecule can't hydrogen bond doesn't necessarily mean that it has a higher boiling point than something that is nonpolar we have to look at the bigger picture larger molecules that have more London dispersion forces can accumulate more London dispersion forces to where the strength of those is greater than that of a single hydrogen bond so we really have to look at the data that is given in order for us to be able to explain certain phenomena that is some molecules that only have London dispersion forces may have higher boiling points than some molecules that are polar. Even though dipole-dipole forces, when we take them one for one, are stronger than that than London dispersion forces, but sometimes large nonpolar molecules have greater London dispersion forces, so great that they are even stronger than that of a single dipole-dipole intermolecular force. So again, it's important to look at the data, i.e. the boiling point, the melting point, vapor pressure to be able to explain these phenomena. Let's take a look at an example. The structure of dimethyl ether and the ethanol molecule are shown below. Dimethyl ether boils at 250K while ethanol boils at 351K. Count for the difference in boiling points by referencing both molecules. So here we have a molecule of dimethyl ether and ethanol. So since we're trying to account for the difference in boiling points, we need to determine what intermolecular forces are present in each of these two molecules. Let's look at ethanol first. First off, ethanol is a molecule, so it has to have London dispersion forces. Second, we take a look, we have an OH that's off to the side here. That results in the molecule being asymmetric, so as a result, we can say that this molecule is polar, and as a result, it is going to have dipole-dipole uh, forces. That oxygen is covalently bonded to a hydrogen, so it is going to have hydrogen bonding as well. If we look at dimethyl ether, the molecule itself, both these molecules are made up of the same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. So the London dispersion forces of dimethyl ether and ethanol are going to be very similar because the molecules are of similar size. We can also say that this molecule is polar as well because of the lone pairs of electrons that are on the oxygen atom in the middle. That's going to result in that carbon-oxygen carbon bond actually being bent. I know it looks linear in the structure that they've drawn out, but that's where they try to trick you a little bit. You have to think of those molecular geometries to help to understand the polarity of this. 
But that carbon oxygen carbon is actually bent, not linear. So as a result, this is going to have dipole-dipole forces. However, because that oxygen is not covalently bonded to a hydrogen, there are no hydrogen bonding. There is no hydrogen bonding in this. So we can think about that. Dimethyl ether boils at a lower temperature than ethanol. Well, the main reason why is because ethanol can hydrogen bond, whereas dimethyl ether cannot. So ethanol has stronger intermolecular forces, whereas dimethyl ether has weaker ones. Stronger intermolecular forces directly correlates to a higher boiling point. So again, I'll reiterate, boiling point is directly correlated to the strength of the intermolecular attractions of each substance. Both substances have similar molar masses and will have similar London dispersion forces. However, ethanol can hydrogen bond while dimethyl ether cannot. This hydrogen bond results in stronger intermolecular attractions between ethanol molecules and results in more energy being required to break the intermolecular forces, thus a higher boiling point. So one thing that's very important is that when you do these comparisons, you really need to make sure that you really explain things in enough detail to where the individual can really understand that you fully understand the concepts. So making sure that you explain all of the intermolecular forces that are present, explain the difference between them and how that directly correlates to a difference in boiling points, all right? So hopefully you've got the idea here about intermolecular forces. Again, we'll take some time and work through this in class, but this is a very important concept because again, it directly correlates to a variety of different physical and chemical properties that you are going to have to take a look at and evaluate based on the Lewis structure, the geometry, and the polarity of the molecules themselves. Hope you've enjoyed the video. This is Jay Lamb Bio. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and as always, if you have any questions, make sure you let me know. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.